If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, that's where we're going to be. Um, remember last week I was telling you guys and encouraging you to journal. Uh, I'm going to share some of my personal journal um, right now. And the reason why we want you to go ahead of the sermon and get before what we're talking about in the text is so that God can speak to you first. The Holy Spirit, we want Him to go first. And so as I was journaling, verse 7, the portion that says, what do you have that you did not receive? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? You see that there? As I was asking the Lord to reveal truth in my heart, to search me in my quiet time, I just simply wrote down, Father, would you speak to me concerning this verse? Now, look, I've been in the church a little little while, you know, and so I know as a good Christian I'm not supposed to boast, okay? Most of us do that, right? But, you know, Christians, a lot of us boast inwardly, don't we? Inwardly, we make judgments, inwardly we think thoughts we won't say them outwardly but we're thinking them inwardly and this is why journaling is so important because you're stopping and you're asking the holy spirit to illuminate the text and to speak to you so let me just read what what i wrote it says all that i have it comes from you jesus All that I am is because of you. Every gift, every breath, every relationship, my job, it it all has come from you. Everything that I have, I've received it. But why in my heart do I boast at times as if I did not receive it? I boast in my heart because I think I have the right doctrine. And then in parentheses, I just put there Pharisees. You know, the Pharisees missed Christ because they were so sure they had the right doctrine. We better be very careful with that posture. I boast because I have special revelation on things. I boast because there's times when I pray for people, they get healed. If anybody gets healed... Because I'm praying for him. I want you to understand something. That wasn't me. If anybody gets healed from a prayer partner up here, that wasn't the prayer partner. It was Jesus. But we think, we think, we think. And it starts to kind of come in like we had something to do with it. And then on our hearts, we can begin to be boastful. We can boast because of our faith. When Romans 12, 3 says, don't think too highly of yourself because each one has been given a measure of faith. The faith that you have, the faith that I have has been given to me and it's been measured out to me because it was God's decision to give me that faith. So who am I to think, oh man, I got more faith than that guy. Now again, good Christians, we don't say that stuff out loud, do we guys? No. But we'll think it, won't we? I boast at times because I understand the concepts of inner healing, and then I can often look down on those who don't believe in inner healing. I boast because of spiritual warfare victories, and I forget about Job, and I forget about Paul, where Paul said, God, take it away, take it away, take it away three times. But God said, no, I'm not taking away this warfare because my strength is going to be perfected in your weakness. And I want you to boast in me alone. And so Paul began to boast in his weakness. When was the last time I boasted in my weakness? I see people boasting in their color. 
their ethnicity. And then I was reminded, I was out to lunch someday, uh, uh, one day before I wrote this, and the guy said, I was asking him to tell me his testimony. <clears throat> and he was saying, I was 18 years old, and I was drinking, and I was doing drugs, and I was, you know, kind of living my life. And the thought, I had this thought, man, if I don't go to a Christian college, then... I'm probably going to have a ruined life. Like if I go to a FSU or U of F, I'm going to ruin my life. And he said, I made the decision, and I just stopped him. And I said, no, God made that decision. God made that decision. Do you know you can't make a good decision without God? You think you're choosing things? It's why scripture says, hey, guys, lean not on your own understanding. Don't try to figure it out because you can't trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And so in the conversation, I was nice. I wasn't kind of giving a, a, a rebuke. It was I did it in a loving way. But no, no, no. God made you make that decision because I've, ne <laughs> I've never seen an 18 year old make a good decision apart from God. Can I get a witness? No offense, my 18-year-olds. And then I was reminded of Romans chapter 1. I'd like you to turn there, please. As God was rebuking me and correcting me and challenging me on just a, a heart that sometimes can be judgmental, a heart that can sometimes be boastful. Again, you'll never know this, by the way, because I would never do that in public because I'm a good pastor. And I want you to like me. I know how to be a Christian in Christendom. And so we can put off how humble we are. Oh, I'm just a humble servant. Look at me. I'm just a humble servant. Come on, church folks. So God reminded me of this, and he said in Romans 1, verse 21, it says, although they knew God. I want you to highlight that. You see, I'm a, I'm a prodigal. I grew up in the church, and I knew God. I knew who Jesus was. I knew who he was. I knew he bled and died for me, that he rose again on the third day. I believed in that. I knew who he was, right? See, we think this passage is about unbelievers. No, it's also for the prodigals. See, we boast in the fact that we made the decision to follow Jesus. Don't do that. They did not honor him as God. I didn't honor Jesus as God. I didn't give thanks to him. And I became futile in my thinking as I ran as hard and as fast away from Jesus as I could. And my heart was darkened. That verse is talking about me. I was thinking I was wise, but really I was a fool. Verse 23, they exchanged the glory of the motor God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up. I want you to highlight that, please. If God would have gave me up, I wouldn't be here today. If God would have gave me up, I wouldn't be here today. Guys, if you've been saved for a long time, you can forget about that, can't you? Be careful of your boasting. God gave them up. There's a fear and a reverence that came over me. As I sat in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, oh God, may I never boast again. May I renounce God, any pride, any arrogance. Any, may I just, this is all about you, Jesus. Burn away what doesn't belong. Burn away what doesn't belong. And see, this is what God is doing in, in me in my quiet time. I want to encourage you, church, to please journal ahead. We're coming into 1 Corinthians chapter 5 next. It's coming. 
And I want you to journal ahead because just like God just kind of rebuked me because internal thoughts that I sometimes have, I can't do that. I can't do that anymore. I don't want to do that. Oh, God created me a clean heart. And that's my time with the Lord. And I encourage you to open his word and say, okay, God, please show me what you're saying. Speak. I want us to look, go back to 1 Corinthians 4, 5, because this is a hard uh, sermon today. <clears throat> and I want to make sure, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't say this last service. I actually made some corrections from last service, so. So hopefully you guys are a little bit better today than the nine. First Corinthians four or five. Listen to what it says. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring the light, the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Listen, we I, in my message today, even though it's hard, even though I'm talking about um, potentially other churches potentially false apostles, potentially other ministers. Listen, listen, listen. My heart is not to pronounce judgment. The heart, and this is the heart of the message that we're in today, is Paul is exposing the super apostles versus a real apostle. And so there's no judgment, there's no condemnation, there's no, right? It is just a compare and contrast. And so please don't mix my passion. Please don't mix this message because I've asked the Lord to judge me with his holy word. To come in like a, a knife and cut away what doesn't belong. That's why Hebrews 4.12, it says, the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. And that sword, it pierces or separates or cuts away the soul from the spirit. So what does that mean? It means this, that you have a soul, what you think, what you feel, and your will, your mind, will, and emotions. That's what's in your soul. And apart from the word of God cutting that and separating out your soul from the spirit, you will and I will be a soulish Christian that is moved by their own feelings, their own thoughts, their own will, their own desires. It can look good on the surface because we're doing good things, but the motive of our heart is laid bare before God. In fact, in Hebrews 12, 13, it says nothing in all creation can be hidden from the word of God. Nothing can be hidden. Everything is laid bare. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I spirit led because I'm trying to be a super apostle? Am I spirit led because I want more likes and more followers? Am I spirit? Or is that the flesh? What's going on here? This is very serious stuff. Why is it serious? Because every single one of us individually will have to stand before Christ and give an account. And we've already talked about the Bema Seat judgment, that some things are not going to make it through. And so today, prepare yourself. It's a little hard. But it's God's word. It's in here. It's the text. And so we have to be faithful to the text. If Bow Down isn't your church home, listen, I pray you go to a church that doesn't teach just topically. Find a church that goes chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Why? Because this passage, it's probably not going to come up on a topical church. Why? Because it's rough. It's rough. And so before we get into it and allow and ask God for it to get in us so the word becomes flesh, let's go ahead and pray again. Father, we just open ourselves up to you. You are good. You are good. You are loving. You are loving. So loving. And I thank you, Jesus, the good shepherd. You have a rod and you have a staff. 
And this passage is kind of like a rod. It's disciplining. It's hard. And so would you pour out your spirit in this place, God, so that we receive it from which it's spoken from a heart of love. Help me, God, to do a better job than I did at the 9 a.m. I need you, God. Help me to communicate the way you want me to communicate. People sense your heart, God, the heart of love that disciplines us for our benefit. Please, Lord, so that we can be holy. We love you. We need you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> So we live in an age where we have celebrity pastors. Again, that's why I started off. Let's not judge. But we got to kind of judge. We got to judge with the word. We live in a church society that measures success by numbers and followers. How many likes do I get? How many followers do I got? Oh, this guy must be something because he has this on. We hear messages like God wants to heal you, God wants to bless you, God wants to expand your territory. Now, is that true? Let's go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 9 and let's see. <laughs> God wants you healthy and wealthy and whole, baby. He's got a plan and purpose in your life. You're the head, you're not the tail. And guys can just kind of go off. Well, that's a, a bold declaration over a congregation, and we don't know if that's true for your individual life. And let me just tell you, we can get a lot of followers if we continue to preach that message. Because Scripture says in the last days, people want teachers so their ears can be tickled. Please tell me how I can have my best life now. Please tell me how I can be great in this world. Please tell me how to get rich. Let's look at Acts chapter 9, verse 15. In context, the apostle Paul, he was killing Christians. Thank you, God, you didn't give him over, but you saved him He's, even as he was killing your children. The grace of God, the grace of God. And so Paul's knocked off his horse and he's blind. And then the Holy Spirit speaks to this guy in Ananias in Acts chapter 9. And he's like, he, it's, and God's speaking to him. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. He says, but the Lord said to him, for he is your chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. That was Paul's gospel invitation. Have you ever heard an invitation to the gospel like that? Come forward. We're going to show you how much you're going to suffer for the name of Christ? No, Chris, nobody's coming up for that invitation. And this is why Jesus said, count the cost before you come. Understand what you're being called to. If you want to be my disciple, deny yourself, take up the cross and follow me. That was the invitation. But Chris, that's too hard. That's why not many follow Jesus. That's why Jesus says, there's a wide road that leads to destruction, and many people are on it, but there's a narrow road that is hard, and there's only a few who find it. There's a verse in the Bible, I don't think it's there by coincidence, it's John 6, 6, 6. You can look it up. It says, many walked away from him, and didn't walk with him anymore. I want you to understand what the enemy's doing right now as he's attacking some of you while you're sitting here. This message is too hard. This guy doesn't understand grace. The 
enemies in the church? Yeah, the enemies in the church. He's always speaking. He's prowling around like a roaring lion. Listen, 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 please listen. The great deception of the enemy is this, that the cost of discipleship is way too high. That's deception. Jesus said, you will experience abundant life if you follow me. But here's the thing, though. A seed has to what? It has to die first. It has to go into the ground. That's what baptism is. I'm dying. Chris Tress, you're dead. So now it's Christ and Christ alone. But that fear of what it could cost me, the fear of what I may lose, the fear of what's going to happen. Oh, man, that stops us from going in to following and surrendering King Jesus. Look, when I got saved, my life did not get better. It got worse. All my friends rejected me. And I was left all alone. I would read God's word, and man, I used to uh, give in to porn and sleep with women and, and do whatever. I, I can't do that anymore. It didn't get easier. It got harder. I had to learn to die to myself and say, okay, not my will, but yours be done. And we've gotten away from the gospel that Christ preached. And I want to bring you back. It is abundant life. You will have a great marriage. But men, listen, the way to have a great marriage is to be like Christ, embrace the cross, and die to yourself. To take the word of God and bathe your wife. I work hard so my wife doesn't have to. You'll have a great marriage and a happy wife because you're indifferent to yourself this is the call i have a phenomenal marriage phenomenal it's amazing no drama amazing i'm in love hopefully she is but i go to work every day and lay it out so she doesn't have to how can i wash her feet how can I become Christ to her? Young single ladies, if you don't have a man that has that mindset, just send them to uh, send them to bowdownchurch.com. I'll never forget a conversation I had when I planted... Uh, the beginning of Bow Down, I, I, somebody gave me a donated 1981 Ford. It had dents in it. It was rusty. But back then, that's all I had. So I was driving it, and it was working. And I remember taking a kid to church one morning. And he says, uh, Pastor Chris, nobody's going to come to your church if you drive a car like this. Now, understand that. I was like, oh, my gosh, you haven't read 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Because we're brought up in a culture that, right, if I tell you to close your eyes and think about your, an apostle, what comes to your mind, right? Three-piece suits, jet airplane, huge crowds, apostle, man, this guy's anointed, man, this guy's, right? And I want you to look now at verse 8. Because we can see what the biblical apostle should look like. Because God gives us marks of an apostle. So let's get into the text. Verse 8. For already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us you've become kings. And again, listen to that. Paul is being uh, a little bit of shade, okay? He's combating that. But what is the message we hear? That God wants you rich. To be a king. And then Paul says, and really it's not Paul, it's the Holy Spirit. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. Verse 9, for I think that God has exhibited us as apostles, and you want to highlight that, as last of all. In our American culture, we want to be first. But this is a position that becomes last. Like men sentenced to death? 
because we've become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. I want you to understand something. A lot of times people think you need to act foolish so you can be a fool for Christ. No. What it means is this, is that you will do what pleases the Lord even if it seems foolish. You're quitting your job? And you're going to go be a missionary and you got to raise 100% of your salary? Fool. It's foolish to the world. Well, well, I paid all this money for you to go to college. You got your degree. Why, why would you waste that? Why would you do It's foolish to the world. But to Christ, to Christ, it may seem foolish. And so understand a fool for Christ's sake that I'm going to please God no matter how it looks, no matter how it looks, and no matter how, what people say. And Paul does the contrast, but you guys are wise in Christ. Uh, we are weak, but you're strong. You're held in honor, but we in disrepute. Disrepute means their reputation was being dishonored. To the present hour, verse 11, we hunger and thirst, we're poorly dressed, we're buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. 1 Corinthians 4, 13, when slandered, we entreat. I want you to understand that word entreat, it, it, it comes from the Greek para, para, to come alongside, like a paraclete would come along. What Paul is saying, when they are slandered by someone, they just don't get in their feelings, they don't blast them on Facebook, they don't pronounce judgment or talk bad about them behind their back, they actually para. They come alongside the very one that's spitting in their face. Why? Because they know they don't know God. So there's compassion. Why do we love our enemies, guys? Because it shows if they're being an enemy to me, they must not know the Jesus I know. Because the Jesus I know doesn't condemn me. The Jesus I know, he does confront me, but then he comes alongside and says, Chris, I'm going to walk with you until you are well. So when people talk about me and slander me and tarnish my re reputation, I don't need to get even. I don't need to justify myself. I leave that in the hands of God. How can I get close to love my enemies? How can I wash Judas's feet, Jesus? Because that's what you did. Oh, this is different. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Eww. Scum of the world? What do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Imagine that valedictorian speech, right? It's graduation, right? Hey, guys, thank you that I'm a valedictorian, but I'm going for the scum of the world. And I pray that for you, too. By the way, this is how you shrink your church, 101. With these types of men. I was gonna. I was gonna have this title: uh, uh, "Happy Mother's Day, Scum of the World, Refuse of All Things." Right? Because we are sticking to the text, but I'm like, that's probably not gonna go well. Let me let me let me read this uh, message portion of of 1 Corinthians four nine through thirteen. And I don't consider message a translation. I just consider it a guy kind of putting in his putting the Bible in his own words, so please don't get offended by the fact I'm reading the message or the massage, if you want to call it the massage. So, so verse 9, okay, it says, it seems to me that God has put us who bear his message on stage in a theater which no one wants to buy a ticket. 
Nobody wants to buy a ticket. We, where, where something everyone stands around and stares at like an accident in the street. We're the Messiah's misfits. You might be sure of yourselves, but we live in the midst of frailties and uncertainties. Paul's saying, I didn't have it all. I don't have it all together, guys. I am frail. You might be well thought of, uh, thought of by others, but we're mostly kicked around. Much of the time, we don't have enough to eat. We wear patched and threadbare clothes. We get the door slammed in our faces. We pick up odd jobs anywhere so we can just make out a living. And when they call us names, we say, God bless you. When they spread rumors about us, we put in a good word for them. We're treated like garbage, potatoes, potato peelings from culture's kitchen. And it's not getting any better. So this is what Paul's saying. This is the marks of the apostle. Jeremy, if you have the list here that we got from the text, you can look at this. This is like, hey, man, I'm an apostle. Like, I'm anointed. I'm an apostle. Okay, great. Let me, let me show you kind of what your job description looks like, apostle. And we make statements like, do you guys believe in the gifts? Do you guys have apostles? Yeah, we got, we got some people like that. Just so you know, I'm not trying to take things out of context. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I want you to see, like, like Paul, this, like, this just wasn't a one-time thing in 1 Corinthians. He's now writing to the church the second time, a second time in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. Listen to what he says. He says, we are afflicted in every way, we're not, we're, but not crushed. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. Like, like this is, guys, this is the prayer for a disciple. Oh, God, help me to die to myself so that only you remain, Jesus. Oh, God. God, please burn away what doesn't belong so that I burn for you and you alone. Light me on fire, God. I love myself so much. Help me, help me, God, to please you and you alone. Like, like this is the cry, and this is what Paul's saying. Look at verse 11. We who live are always, always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh, so death is at work in us, but life in you. I want to die so that you can live. That's what our Savior did on the cross. This is who we follow. So guess what, guys? Girls? I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians 11, a few chapters over. 2 Corinthians 11. And we're going to keep going so that you can understand this, this, this overarching theme of what's going on here. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13, it says, it says, for such men are false apostles. So church, there's going to be real apostles, there's going to be false apostles. You want to see a real apostle? Look for things like, like that. You want to see a false apostle? They're avoiding that stuff. Verse 13, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no surprise that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, but their end will correspond to their deeds. You need to highlight that. Their end will correspond to their deeds. You've got to not listen just because they say they're an apostle. You've got to look at these deeds. Does that line up with how they roll? And Jesus warned us of that in Matthew 7. Hey, there's going to be these false prophets. There's wolves that are coming in sheep's clothing. 
And so you're going to tell what kind of tree it is by the fruit that it bears. We are to look for fruit. We are to be fruit inspectors. We are to look at somebody's life, not just say, oh, well, they have this title as apostle or they have this title as pastor. One of my favorite guys is Watchman Nee. He's a hero of mine because he was in prison for 20 years. And this guy here, if you're saved, he'll make you feel like you're not saved, okay? Like he comes with it, man. But this is what Watchman Nee says. All the problems in the church today rest on the shoulders of the minister. That's a heavy weight for me. Leave me alone, Watchman Nee. No, they're responsible for their personal salvation, Watchman Nee. What's true here? What's true here? All the problems in the church today rest on the soldier, soldier, shoulders of the minister. True preaching never brings in cleverness or eloquence. Clever, eloquent, funny, that guy can preach. He's clever. You guys know I'm not clever. So it reminded me, and this is me, not Watchman, but when he said that, I just had to sit in that. And I got to take responsibility as a minister, guys. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Just listen. Don't go there. It says, Paul did not come with lofty speech or wisdom. He preached Christ crucified. He did it in weakness, fear, and much trembling completely dependent on the strength of God. That's how Paul was. And this is what Watchman Nee says ministers should be. He also goes on, Watchman Nee say, some ministers may speak of the Holy Spirit, yet people touch the flesh or the natural giftings of the minister, but are not touched by the Holy Spirit. Ooh. Some ministers talk about the cross, but where are the marks of the cross on them? Those are the marks of the cross on Paul. And he was filling up, filling up. So, wow. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 4.14. Chris, this is heavy. I know. Happy Mother's Day, guys. Over the years, I've been in churches and been in places and I would see pastors and worship leaders be called to another church. But pretty much every time that happened, it was always to a bigger church that paid more money. So now you question, is this a hireling or a true shepherd? Again, don't pronounce judgment before it's time, <laughs> okay? Because God may be calling them to a bigger church. That pays more. But it's just interesting to me, it seems like in our American Christianity that God doesn't really call people to decrease. It's always expand the kingdom and bigger, better, more, more powerful, more money. But never, never the other way. Never the other way. And so this is why this is important. Let's continue on with this text, 1 Corinthians 4, 14. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. I want you to highlight my beloved children. How did you hear what I've been talking about at the beginning of this service? Did you hear it as like, oh, man, this is really hard. This guy's really mean. This is, this, Right? Or did you hear it coming from someone that really, really loves you and want what's best for you? Do you know that's why a lot of people come in to bow down and they, they, they don't come back? <laughs> this guy here, he's like just too extra, bro. He doesn't understand grace, man. Do you think they may have said that about Paul? With what I'm reading, what he's reading?
Paul didn't do this to bring shame. That's what he just said. I'm not trying to shame you guys. I really, really love you because you're my children in the faith and I want what's best for you. So I'm calling you to a righteous standard. And a lot of us may hear judgment and negative condemnation and just. It's because maybe we have father issues we've never dealt with. I want you to play the uh, Nick Saban clip, please. I've told you three times already today. Why are you so tough on people? Well, I, I don't know if that's fair that I'm really tough on people. We create a standard for how we want to do things. And everybody's got to buy into that standard or you really can't have any team chemistry. You know, mediocre people don't like high achievers and high achievers don't like mediocre people. Here's one of the best football coaches in college, and did you see him yelling at the guy? Three times like that. I'm not trying to be like Nick Saban. I'm going to be me. But listen, there is a standard that Christ has called us to disciple. 1 John 2, verse 6 says this, whoever abides in who says he abides in Christ, ought to walk the same way in which Christ walked. That's the standard. Ephesians 4, when it talks about the gifts, but the gifts are to build up the church so that, Ephesians 4, 13, they become mature to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the standard, but... Some, 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 listen, some have watered down the gospel so much that, oh, hey, bro, you don't understand grace. You're legalistic, man. You don't understand the love of God. Look, man, I spanked my kids, both of them. Why? Because there were certain things that just didn't happen in our house. And one of them was disrespect to the queen. You don't ever do that. You don't ever talk back to mom. That's a no-no. You talk back to me, you won't, you won't get spanked. You talk back to mom, eh, spank. I did it in love. I always prayed for him. Wasn't out of anger. I'm triggering some people here. But I can't lose my kids. They're over 18, so I can, I can be free now. Why did I do it? Why did I bring the rod? Why did I call them to a righteous standard? Because I love them. Why did I teach them to say, yes, sir? Yes, ma'am. No, sir. No, ma'am. Because I want them to walk with honor. I want them to. Now, I hope they call you that. If not, let me know. I still got the rod. I want them to walk with respect and honor to those. And so Paul, he's verse 15, he still explains his heart. He's like, guys, you've got countless guides in Christ. First Corinthians four, verse 15. You don't have many fathers, though, because I came your fa I became your father in Christ Jesus to the gospel. I urge you then be imitators of me. And so he's like, imitate me. Don't imitate these hucksters. Don't imitate these false apostles. Imitate me, imitate me, imitate me. I'll never forget going through my church plant training when I planted a church. And they, it's what, this is what I was taught. Before you take an offering, tell the people you're going to take an offering. You need to tell a compelling story so that their hearts would be touched. And after that compelling story or video, now they have the why they should give. And then while they're passing the plate, sing a song that kind of challenges that. And it's been proven that you'll make 33% more. That makes me want to vomit. Because that's manipulation. Do you know what's on our tithe box back there? It's 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. It says, don't let anybody manipulate you on what you should give. You decide in your own heart before the meeting. What's funny is before that verse, it says God will 
will be pressed down, shaken up, and overflow. And most people stop right there. Why? Now, here's why i got to remind us again, guys. I'm coming, I'm coming pretty hard right now. Just because the church takes an offering, you better not judge them. God will handle that. Don't pronounce judgment before it's time. But listen, what we do here, even though we could make 33% more, because some people just, what we do here is we want to be pure before the Lord. And we don't want to admit, we don't, we don't want to manipulate people. I'm not going to do that. Why? Because I'm going to stand. I would rather have nothing as a church and stand before Jesus and say, I was faithful. We were faithful as elders. We didn't, we weren't hucksters. We weren't tricksters. We preached your truth, God, and we didn't compromise. Verse 17. That is why I sent Timothy to to you. That is why I sent you, Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the faith. Now, I had you highlight before he's talking to the church. What did he call them? Beloved. What's missing? Faithful. Why is he calling Timothy faithful? Because Timothy had proven, had proven that he was faithful. This church hadn't proven they were faithful yet. They were beloved. Christ loves you, but Are you faithful? Would you embrace those 16 things that were listed if Christ asked you to do that? If you had a calling like the Apostle Paul and he was going to show you things that you must suffer for him, would you still follow Jesus? Or are you following Jesus for... Timothy's my beloved and faithful child. I want you to listen to Paul talk about Timothy in Philippians chapter 2, verse 20. It says, for I have no one like him, Timothy, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. They all seek their own interest but not those of Jesus Christ. Those of Jesus Christ, what did Jesus say in Matthew 6, 33? That we seek the kingdom first and his righteousness. We don't seek our own interests. We seek the interests of others. And again, this is why he was sending Timothy to remind him of, of man, guys, this, this is what we're looking for here. Be very careful who's coming into the church at Corinth. If you could throw up the, the, the picture of uh, Devante, his wedding picture, please. So I'm in uh, Monday uh, night. Uh, Devante's in my, in my prayer group on Monday night. Men's prayer group, you're welcome to come. But we're going around, we're sharing our prayer requests. And he's praying, uh, would you pray for me? Man, I, I don't know if I can be a good father because I didn't have a father. Well, let me just tell you something. And I told this to the last church. Ryan Gunn started working with that young man. Um, and he's been with him for over 10 years. And he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ through the ministry of Ryan Gunn. Ryan Gunn became his father in the gospel. Devante, being discipled, was married. And, and by the way, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm throwing up the picture of me marrying him. But Ryan did all the work. I got the apostle suit on, by the way. <coughs> I got one suit back in the day. I bury and I marry in the same suit. So anyway, so I don't like suits. Um, so here's Devante. His wife's pregnant because they waited until their wedding night to do what they were called to do. This kid's in here. She's now pregnant, and he's like, I don't know if I can be a good dad. My encouragement to him is to imitate 
Christ and imitate what you saw in Ryan Gunn and continue to look at dads that are good and take them out to breakfast and say, man, how can I be a good dad? How can I be a good father? But he's going to be a good father. Why? Because I already see him doing things in a right way. He's obeying Jesus. And the other day I was parked uh, at the Lord's place and there's this homeless guy coming up to me asking me for food, money, blankets and all of this. And go ahead and throw the next picture up. And so I, 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 I'm like, I've got to go somewhere, but I'll come back after I'm done and I'll bring you a blanket. I'll bring you water. I'll bring you this. I prayed for the guy. But as I was in my conversation with the guy, this black car pulls up, out jumps Devante. He's got food. He's got water. He's got blankets. And he gave it to that guy. And he's walking that guy over to the bench because he was, he, was, he was a handicapped guy. And he just loved that guy. Let me tell you something. That guy's a servant. That guy's proving his worth. That guy's going to be a good father. Because he's already doing what God says to do. Serve. Be faithful. Be faithful. Serve. Verse 18. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. You see that humility? If the Lord wills. I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist of talk, but in power. I've heard a lot of people break this verse down. And I think they miss sometimes the context of this. Put up the 16 things again, Jeremy. It takes real power to keep moving forward in Christ when this describes your life. Jesus warned at the end, many are going to come to me. We did this in your name. We did this in your name. And he's going to say, I never knew you. Healing signs and wonders can be done by false prophets. Matthew chapter 24. So is that what he's talking about? The kingdom doesn't consist in talk, but in power? No, 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 no. The power to keep moving forward with the right kind of heart to bless your enemies, that's the kind of power that he's talking about. A life that's led by the fruit of the spirit, which is love and joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, self-control, no matter what. Even if all hell breaks loose, I still walk in the spirit because Christ is, that's power. That's power. I'm not against healings because they happen. We've had a couple recently. But that's what I believe he's talking about. There's a power when we embrace suffering with a joy. And we're mocked, but we we, we rejoice because they're mocking us because we know Jesus' promise. Blessed are you when they persecute you. There's joy in our heart. We don't respond like the rest of the world. That's power. That's power. Verse 21, and let's finish with this. It says, and what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? Jesus is the lamb, but he's also the lion. What do you want? He's confronting them. He's rebuking them. Do they want the rod or do they want the gentle Paul? The rod was used by a shepherd to kill sheep, to ward off enemies. The rod was also used to lay on the wool of the sheep so that the wool kind of bent over and they would be able to see bugs and parasites. The weight of the rod did that. Understand the wool represents our flesh, and sometimes God lays the rod on on the wool of our lives. And I started this message today with how God laid the, the rod of his word into me. Because there was some boasting going on in my heart. And God reminded me, he reminded me that In Romans 1, he could have gave me up over to what my heart wanted. But he didn't because he's so loving. In fact, he's so loving 
He's so loving that he gave the rod to his one and only son so that you and I get to go free. What a gospel, what a, what a savior, what a God of love and grace. We deserve wrath, but God loved us so much that he poured out his wrath on his one and only son so that we, we, we may have life. Thank you, God. Let's go ahead and, and, and have the worship team come on up. And listen, if you're here today and you've, you've met, never made a decision to give your life to Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. This is a really hard message, and so if you get saved today, this is going to be a miracle. <laughs> but God's calling you. And I don't know what's going on in your heart right now. I don't know if you can relate to me. That while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. While I deserved the rod, I, I didn't get that. I got grace. And that's what the cross represents. And when we look at the death of Jesus on that cross, it represents him who knew no sin becoming sin for us. We get to go free because Jesus didn't get to go free. All my sins get washed away because he took my sin upon himself on that cross. Why did he do it? Because he desires that no one should perish, but that all may have eternal life in him. And if you've never made a decision to Acknowledge that you've sinned against a holy God, that you are in need of a Savior. You've never said, Jesus, I want to give you my life. I want to give you my life. I want to follow you, Jesus. You've never done that. I'm going to give you an opportunity right now, just where you are. Just repeat after me in your heart if you mean it. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge my sin. And I ask you to forgive me. I also acknowledge that my sin nailed you to the cross. That you were perfect. And you didn't deserve it. Thank you for dying in my place. I also know that when you died, you didn't stay dead, but you rose again, Jesus. I believe that. And I'm deciding today to follow you. To follow you as Lord and King and Savior of my life and I really mean it. And would you come into my heart? Would you come into my life? And be my King. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. And I ask this in your most holy name. Amen.